Good evening, happy Indie Bookstore Day, and welcome to Gibson's Bookstore Remote. I'm Ryan, I'm a bookseller. I'm so excited for tonight's very special event. Joining us tonight are my coworkers, Elizabeth, our events coordinator, and Joe, one of our incredible booksellers, as well as sci-fi fantasy authors, Kat Howard, Kelly Braffitt, Kat Valenti, and Freya Mosk. Hi, everyone. Um, this is going to be a fairly laid back casual event where um, some of us made some cocktails, some alcoholic, some not. Mine is ginger ale and orange juice. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to celebrate Indie Bookstore Day. We're going to talk about what we've been reading and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, Elizabeth mentioned earlier, but I will reiterate, please in the chat, share what you've been reading. Um, if, if you in our audience made a drink, please share what you are drinking. We'd love to hear about that. Um, and if you have any questions for any of us, our authors or the Gibsons employees, <laughs> absolutely throw them in the chat or in the Q&A function. Um, for now, let's let's jump in with some of our author intros. Uh, Kat Howard, let's start with you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your books? I am coming to you from New Hampshire, much like Gibson's. Um, I write science fiction a little bit, mostly fantasy and some comics. Um, my most recent novel is An Unkindness of Magicians. And I am about a week and a half away from turning in the draft of the sequel to my editor. So if I'm a little bit um, frazzled or <laughs> feral this evening, that's why. Oh, and I'm drinking a last word because I like the name of it. <laughs> Very nice. Um, how about Kelly Braffitt? Tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself and your and your amazing book. Well, um, like. Obviously, I'm Kelly. Um, I am coming to you from upstate New York-ish, upstate unless you're from Buffalo, in which case you laugh at me when I say that. <laughs> um, and my book is, my, my fantasy novel is The Unwilling. It's actually my fourth book, um, but the others are all sort of crime novels, so this was a departure. And I actually am waiting on edits for the sequel to that, too. So it's a sequel festival happening here. <laughs> Oh, that is so exciting. Uh, <laughs> it's been a long uh, pandemic. <laughs> yes. Uh, Kat Valenti, you're up next. Uh, yeah, so I write a little bit of everything if it can't happen in the real world. Uh, that's what I write, essentially. Um, <laughs> I've been on quite a science fiction kick the last couple of years, but I write fantasy, science fiction, horror, uh, novels, short stories, poetry. Uh, people would probably mostly know me from either my novel Space Opera or from the Fairyland series, maybe Deathless. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've written over 40 books, so uh, take, take your choice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I also am in the middle of edits right now. <laughs> Oh my, for, uh, my next middle grade book which is called Osmo Unknown and the Eight Penny Woods um, which will be out I know right we didn't say the title of it for a long time because the title kept changing so that's actually the first time I have uttered the title in public um, and uh, I have two books coming out this year one is a climate change dystopia called The Past is Red and the other is um, a thriller it's a murder book but it's definitely still fantasy uh, called Comfort Me with Apples. Oh, yes, which has Sounds an amazing great. cover, by the way. <laughs> Both of the really cool covers, but I feel like you can tell online that Comfort Me with Apples is a cool cover and yeah. you don't see how cool the cover is to past is read until you're holding it because it's like that kind of art where every tiny detail is actually something crazy and then it all makes up the words so like you have to get a magnifying glass out to see all this stuff in, in past is right so they're they're both amazing covers and so oh. you know in um july and october this year. oh that is so exciting and freya mask you Hello. are coming to us from australia <laughs> yes so i'm coming from you coming to you from early in the morning which is why i am drinking a breakfast cocktail <laughs> it has juice in it uh, and I do not have a physical copy of my book to wave around yet because I am still in the early stages of my debut year. I have managed to get the cover on my iPad. There we go. So pretty. 
So it's called A Marvelous Light uh, and it is, we're describing it as a queer historical fantasy of very bad manners. And it's about magicians and murder and manor house parties full of terrible people in Edwardian England. So that is coming out in November of this year from Tor.com. And it is amazing. It's, it's so Thank you, Kat. <laughs> It's so good. Joe has already made it their staff pick. <laughs> Far in advance. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, amazing. We will uh, we will certainly put all of the links to these books in the chat, but I am also going to, after the event, uh, make a shoppable list for the website. So um, don't worry about jotting down all the books we talk about because everything we mentioned during this event, I will put onto a list. So there will be a, a handy dandy spot for you to go shop everything we recommend, <laughs> which uh, there will surprise. be. Surprise. <laughs> I already did that. Hey, look at you. But, but Brian, we'll if you could keep track of all the books that we discussed that yeah. they haven't written. Yeah, yeah we're, we're going to add to it. I'm not allowed to use my mind reading powers. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. So let's, uh, let's jump in. Should we talk about what we've been reading recently? I can certainly start. Um, I, so, Okay. I've been I've been prepping for basically a summer of interviews for the Lay Down podcast, shameless plug. Um, <laughs> and I just chatted with Josh Mallerman, who wrote Bird Box, about his next book, Goblin, which I just finished. And ooh, if you like horror, you will love Goblin. It is so good. It's a novel made up of six novellas that all center around the town of Goblin, which is this very weird, almost like Twilight Zone type, like weird things happen and scary things happen. And each novella focuses on one central character who is either uh, lives in Goblin or is visiting Goblin. Um, and there's like this through line of obsession and th they go like maybe a little crazy or maybe there's a little murder. <laughs> it is so incredible. I could not put it down. I read it cover to cover. I couldn't stop. Um, and yeah, so if you are into horror at all, and it's not like crazy, crazy scary, but it's definitely creepy. Um, highly recommend that. That comes out May 18th. Um, and my interview with him will be on the podcast May 18th as well. So definitely listen to that. Um, and then I have two others. I'm also in the process of scheduling an interview with Grady Hendrix. So I am catching up and I'm reading My Best Friend's Exorcism, which is fantastic. Right? So good. Um, very like 80s campy horror. It's it's fun if you like um like horror comedy movies you'll love you'll love this it's it's a blast it's a delight um and then I suspect I won't be the only person to talk about this tonight but I just got my arc of a spindle splintered by Alex E. Harrow and yeah yeah um the lovely folks at tour.com shout out to irene who i think might be here uh sent the booksellers at gibson's our arcs of alex's next book which is um like sleeping beauty mashed up with into the spider verse it's so good it's so good it's just a total twist on the sleeping beauty tale and Oh, it's so good. Um, but so that's what I've been reading. <laughs> uh, and I could go on and on and on forever. So I will throw it to someone else. Who wants to go next? You can't just point Elizabeth. No, <laughs> no I'm, I'm pointing at Joe because I already had half of a monologue. So I feel it's only fair okay, to let Joe so go I, and then I will go. Okay. Um, so I've been in a bit of a reading slump, honestly, lately. But uh, yesterday, I picked up an arc I have of All's Well by Mona Awad, uh, author of Bunny. And it's so good. I was up so late last night reading it. It was incredible. So it's about a woman who's a theater director at a community college and she is trying to put on a production of all's well that ends well and her cast of college students is not here for it at all and uh they want to do Macbeth and so it's has elements of like 
retelling of these stories, but also this mutinous cast trying to take the power from the director to do the play they want to do. So oh, that sounds really, so good. Really good. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Um, and that, that's what I have. I love Elizabeth, that. if you want to go. All right. So I am a, a book polygamist. Um, I, I'm a mood reader. I don't, I can't just read one. Part of that is ADHD. Part of that is that I have kids. So I have books stashed around the house and wherever I am and I have free reading time, that's the book that I read because if I have to go find my book, I will get distracted. Um, so I have three books that I'm reading. I'm reading The Unbroken by C.L. Clark, which my friends lost their minds over. It's a fantasy about a uh, shades of colonialism and imperialism. And it's mostly about a character named Terrain who um, was conscripted by which they mean they kidnapped children from their colonies, raised them in their army, and then kind of sent them back to fight in their army. I'm only about 25% of the way through, but she and the princess who she, like, there was, there's some hanky panky going to be going on. And like, there's, there's, she's been sent back to her homeland to fight and crush a rebellion. And they're just like, is it nice to be home? She's like, I was five. I don't remember it, but like, sure, go ahead and be a jerk about this. You know, like, yes, remind me that I was a kidnapped child. Um, and, uh, my friends lost their minds over the cover because it's like this real power pose, like terrain's arms are like arm goals. Just she's, she's this soldier she's real badass and it's there's an lgbtq romance um and the fight scenes so far are pretty good there's magic um and i i'm only 25 percent of the way in so i don't know if i can properly give a review but it's good um i'm also reading yes and by reading i mean listening to yes and i love you which is a romance novel about um two person well of course well almost all romance novels are about two persons um almost all of them not all of them this one is and it follows a woman named holland and she has tourettes and she is very shy and closed off like her whole life she's been judged for it so she's just like i'm just not going to talk to people and she is a a, a secret um, entertainment blogger like she reviews things she under the name Miss Poppy and she has a very large following only her company that uh, she's a freelancer the company that has hired her the newspaper is just like this is great but we're gonna move to video blogging so Miss Poppy is gonna have a grand reveal and she's like but the reason that I'm good at this is because no one can see my tics I'm freaking out at the thought that I'm gonna have to be on video and people will see my tics and judge me so she and she has anxiety on top of that as well. She's not she's not down for this. The her the other protagonist, his name is Jasper, and he is an aspiring improv artist. So um, where they're going there is that he's going to teach her how to like improvise and be comfortable on camera. And it's so far it's pretty cute. Again, only twenty five percent of the way in. And what's the third one that I'm reading? I don't even know what I'm reading anymore. I'm reading. <laughs> no, probably just those two who knows who knows oh and I just finished come again by I think Rob Webb which is not quite a romance novel um it starts with a woman named Kate whose partner of 28 years has recently died of cancer and she's like I'm gonna kill myself at four o'clock today Siri set an alarm. Um, and it's actually quite funny. Um, it's very poignant and sad and sweet at the first part. And at first I was like, I thought this was supposed to be funny mm -hmm. um, because she's talking about um, how when your partner dies, suddenly you feel very old because it used to be that there was someone who saw you and remembered what you were like at 18 or 19 or 20 and then when they're gone nobody remembers what you like I was just struck by this and it's just she she looks in the mirror and she's like all of a sudden all I see is 45 
So she's like, oh, Siri, set an alarm for four o'clock. I'm going to kill myself. And could you please just delete the last 10,000 days? Thanks. Um, and she's like, my, she's like, I've got nothing left to live for. And I probably am going to be killed by the Russians because I may or may not have stolen some incriminating evidence. And I'm going to leak it to the press because she works for an online reputation management firm. And she's just like, what am I doing? I'm helping horrible people fix their reputations no i'm done and so she like steals evidence and then she's like this is a terrible idea i'm just i'm just done and then she wakes up and she's 18 and she's in the her college dorm room on the first day of her freshman year and she's like oh my god i can save him so she's like i meet him tonight i meet my best friend tonight i meet all these people tonight if i can just convince him that the slow growing brain tumor is in his head which by the way if a complete stranger walks up to you and says hey nice to meet you by the way you have a brain tumor in your head on your wife from the future that doesn't really go over well so she's like i just have to do everything exactly the same and then of course she cocks it up immediately yeah um absolutely immediately which is hilarious and it's it's i was just crying laughing at this book um and it has very poignant and sweet moments and lines that i'm like i need to write that down i am not a person who writes down lines from books but I did because they were just, they struck me and they were so beautiful. Lines like she froze half her heart so that she could, the other half could feel the warmth of his son or something. Like, you're just like, what, Aww. what is happening here? And then like they, then you're just like bursting out laughing the next line. So that one was called Come Again by Rob Webb, I think, or Helen Webb. Um, we'll write it down. Yeah. Um, and it was just really, really good. Oh, and her best friend might be working for MI6. It do, you don't you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> layers. This book has layers. <laughs> awesome. Uh, who wants to go next? Mini, mini, mini. Cat Howard. <laughs> <laughs> so I brought I brought visual aids. Nice. Um, one book. This is out next week. Um, Folkhorn by Angela Me Young Her. And it is wonderful and amazing. And it starts out in Antarctica um, and it's uh, folklore and finding yourself and finding a life and finding a family and figuring out who you are and maybe abandoning your dissertation after you've gone to Antarctica to finish it and possibly being haunted by your mother or the stories that she's told you. Um, it's gorgeous, it's wonderful, it's, one of, it's completely just, impossible to describe, to describe and wonderful to read and I can't recommend it enough. Um, I've also been on a big nonfiction kick right recently and the new biography of Sylvia Plath, Red Comet by Heather mm -hmm. Clark. Oh, so good, so good. I mean, like it's a thousand pages long and it is absolutely worth every single one of those pages. That's so nice. that's what I, that's what I've been reading. I love it. Uh, Kelly, what have you been reading? What have I been reading? Well, I've also been, I mean, I have this very Baroque, like what I need read next system, which means that I am literally reading books that I bought five years ago because it's like a first in first out kind of deal. It's, it's ridiculous. It means that I'm always very far behind, <laughs> but Right now, I'm actually reading something relatively current, which is Cast by, is it Isabel Wilkerson? Wilkerson, yeah. Isabel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew the Wilkerson. I wasn't sure about the other yeah. Um, yeah, it is Isabel. Yeah. And it's blowing my mind and teaching me a lot of things that I didn't learn in school. And one thing that is very cool about it is that while I was in the midst of this, my 11-year-old um, came home from school and said, my teacher said that we should learn things that she didn't learn in school. So today we talked about Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd verdict. And I was like, hot damn teacher, I'm gonna write you a note of appreciation because there are certainly a lot of things that I did not learn growing up. So, um, and the other thing I'm reading, and this is again, one of those things that I bought, I think at a used book sale a million years ago, but I'm actually listening to it because I decided that would work better is um, Bruno, Bruno Badelheim's The End of, en or The Uses of Enchantment. I managed to get that out. So, so, so there's a little hit of some discredited Freudians for you. Um, and it is bonkers. Um, and 
alternately unintentionally hilarious and occasionally like these little like like I keep saying to my husband like I keep thinking that I should stop listening to this book but then it's got these little wonderful moments of brilliance that pop up through all of the like penis envy and weird stuff it's it's a collection of you know it's it's a collection of essays about very strict Freudian analysis of fairy tales which was immensely popular in like 1972 or something like that um but it's uh it's been on my shelf for ages and I think I was supposed to read it in my freshman year psych class in college and I didn't and now I'm listening to it and it's an experience <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's definitely one that I had to buy in college and I don't know that I ever got all the way through it <clears throat> but I definitely had to reference it in some papers so yeah oh better yeah <laughs> Just pointed out in the, in the chat that Bedlam's uh, thoughts on autism are terrible and uh, oh, awful. He was awful. Like it's and your schizophrenia. Like yeah, affectionate enough or too affectionate. It's always mom's fault. That's absolutely true. Like I think that the sort of cat and eyes eyes lighting up at, at that book is simply because when you are an academic, um, it's one of the few books that sort of deals with fantasy yeah. fiction in any way. So it really is this sort of. <laughs> light spot and that's not what uses of enchantment deals with at all so you can kind of put your blinders on but um as far as like old books that say hey actually fairy tales are useful in a practical way it's it's often one of the first ones that young academics come across mm. well and the reason that i bought it is because i remembered having that exact feeling in that freshman year um college psych class where it was like the one thing that had something in it that I felt like was kind of relevant to me. But yeah, no, like on the third chapter, he's like, ah, schizophrenia is caused when, you know, the child doesn't have it. And it's just, yeah. Oh, he's, there's always, a lot to discard there. Brother, it's but, always mom's fault. Like it's just, it's uh, always mom. It's always mom. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, don't confuse our enthusiasm for supporting him. By no, oh, no. <laughs> no, oh, no, 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 not a good person. Well, Many no, ways. Don't listen to old dead psychologists. No. No. Highly <laughs> problematic. Very. Uh, Kat Valenti, what are you? What are you reading? Well, I've been in kind of a reading slump as well, uh, but <laughs> I was going over what I've been sort of the the sort of four books that I've been going between lately, and I'm like, oh, apparently I chose to give men a shot. Uh, <laughs> recently, <laughs> so much of what I read is like, I'm like, oh wow, I'm reading four books by men. Look at me! Oh, it's it's really it's very woke of me to to give men uh, a chance to to have their voices on the the written page. Hashtag on voices. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> I am in fact reading four books by men. Uh, I just started Ministry for the Future. Uh, Kim Jenner Robinson's um, newest mm -hmm. book, uh, and I'm I'm not really as far into that enough to to give a um, review of it, except that it is so Kim Stanley Robinson. I really strongly feel that this is a book where if you if you have bought into Robinson's shtick, then you will love it, and if you haven't, it might take a bit. Um, it's not one of the ones that is a huge departure like uh, 2312, but I dig Robinson, so um, I'm enjoying it. Uh, I've been reading A Moral Man which is by Derek Delgadio, who uh, did the one man show in and of itself that is, is on Hulu, um, which messed me up that show. And so I was like, who is this guy who I cannot decide if he's a genius or a douche. Uh, I just, I, I can't figure it out. And so I decided I'd read his book. I uh, still don't know, uh, but it's, it's, it's very much a memoir of a young boy discovering stage magic and, and his love of it. Um, but it plays with truth in a big way, which is what that show is all about. So um, it's very interesting. I am under, uh, I, I'm reading under orders from a teen girl, uh, Scythe by Neil Schusterman, uh, yes. which is a YA novel about a world in which um, people don't die anymore uh, unless these people called Scythes uh, do it for them. Um, and that is actually really, really good. It's, it, it is, it moves fast. It's very spooky. I would have absolutely obsessed over it as a teenager. So I really recommend that. Um, for young readers. And what was the fourth? Oh, the fourth one is, um, I just finished Road of Bones uh, by Christopher Golden, which isn't out yet. Um, it is horror. It is horror. If you don't like horror, this is probably not for you because it is one of the scariest horror books I've ever read. And I'm a horror fan from way back. It's about um, this thing, which is absolutely real. Uh, the Road of Bones in Siberia, where they basically just 
killed and buried the workers as the cold took them. Uh, along the way, there's like an estimate of 600,000 people buried somewhere along this huge road across Siberia. Uh, so the fact that nobody's done a haunted road thing about this yet is kind of insane, actually. But uh, from the very beginning, it is just rakeneck, really scary, really, uh, I don't want to say graphic because it's not about that. But it's just incredibly atmospheric and it's just dark and in the middle of winter and ugh. But it's, an, it's a very, very good book. And it is certainly off the beaten path of what horror uh, is, is comfortable with culturally. So I, I found it really, really good. That's amazing. And that's called Road of Bones. Is that mm -hmm. the title? The awesome. co cover is amazing. If you look the cover uh, up online, it, it was just released and it's really great. Mm. I am adding that to my list. <laughs> I was going to say, Ryan Ryan runs our horror racks. And it's just yeah, like, yeah, I it's definitely your eyes like, lighting up. I want to warn people who aren't much for horror. It is really frightening. Nothing really throws me that much with horror because I've been obsessed with it and reading it since I was nine. Yeah. This got my heart racing. Oh, good. I'm excited. <laughs> uh, and Freya, how about you? What have you been reading? I've been on a kick of reading fantasy novels that are also very good at mystery structure because I am attempting to steal these people's powers for my own nefarious purposes. <laughs> uh, the first one of which I just finished recently, I haven't got it as a physical copy because I only get sent EARCs because nobody sends things to Australia, but it is uh, A Master of Gin by P. Jelly Clark, which is the first full-length novel in his Supernatural Investigators in Steampunk Fantasy Cairo series. And if you enjoy a uh, sort of semi-procedural with a lot of fantasy world building and an incredibly dapper lesbian investigator who's just an amazing character, highly recommend that one. Um, I also just finished, I do have some physical aids for these ones, uh, Hollow Empire by Sam Hawke, who is a fellow Australian fantasy writer, and she writes pretty chunky high fantasy. This is the second book in a duology, but both of them are also really interesting mysteries, and the way that she plays with point of view and like feeds you information throughout while also giving you this really cool world building, high fantasy, political intrigue is really, really good. And I think she's a bit underread. So I would really encourage anybody to check out Sam Hawke's books. And the last one is Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas, which I'm a little bit late on. Everybody was talking about this last year. Uh, this is a YA sort of urban fantasy paranormal about a young trans brujo who accidentally raises this dead spirit of the school bad boy and they have to work out who killed him and why. And I'm only halfway through that one, but I'm really, really enjoying it. Awesome. So that's where I'm at at the moment. Lots of mysteries. I love it. I love it. Um, Elizabeth, I know you prepped some very fun questions for our panelists. Would you like to jump into those? <laughs> um, yes. Well, I was, one of the questions was if there is an author whose heart you would like to cut out and eat so that you might gain their powers, which author would that be? And Freya, you just mentioned that you would like to gain some powers from authors. Is there a particular one that you would like to cut? I was thinking out? about this. I think if we're allowed necromancy, then Terry Pratchett. Mm -hmm. If we are not allowed necromancy, if we are only preying on the living, then I would go with Natasha Pulley, Ooh. who is probably one of my favorite writers who is working at the moment. I adore all of the books of hers that I've read so far. I think she has a really great gift for literary style with really strong characters, really interesting use of speculative elements, really strong historical books. They're a really nice sort of Venn diagram overlap of all the things that I like reading and writing. So she would be my pick. That is an excellent answer and went way more in depth than I was even hoping for. I love this. I feel like we need to add a secondary question in there. Which of these powers that you are hoping to steal are they? Because I particularly was imagining oh wow, like they're really good at writing three books a year because they have a deal with the devil. But I suppose, I mean, there's also some authors that I'm just like, yeah, and they somehow managed to be incredibly charming on this and this, and somehow they fit into like a size four pant at the same time. And then you're just like, how? So, I mean, I really love the in-depth that you went for which power specifically you were going to steal from Natasha Pulley. Wonderful. Um, what about Kat Valenti? I mean, I got to say, I'm pretty confident of my own writing. So I'm thinking, I'm really drilling down on the specific powers here. So like um, Kazuo Ishiguro, uh, I want his power 
to write speculative fiction but get the money and respect of someone who doesn't mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what I want uh, I want to be able to write a book about King Arthur and dragons and have people pretend that it's literary fiction like that's that's the power I want uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that but I want to I, I drill down very very precisely uh, I can respect that answer <laughs> a lot a lot Cat Howard <sighs> Well, I'm going to avoid necromancy because I like my heart full of blood and warm. Um, I think, uh, you know, I am kind of obsessed with how Megan Abbott can plot um, and just make things just so tight and tense and noirish and just compelling. And I cannot tell you how excited I am for her book that's coming out this summer. Um, she's absolutely one of my favorite writers and just like I said just the way she can just twist the story and twist you with it is great and I'm she's lovely and I'm sure she needs her heart very much but I'm going to borrow it for a bit she may also be coming on the podcast this summer D don't don't tell her that last bit that <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kelly whose heart are you stealing Oh, I've been sitting here trying desperately to figure this out. Um, I think probably if I could steal anybody's heart, it might be Kate Atkinson. Mm. Because she, I think more than anybody else, like I remember reading Life After Life and then putting it down and going, well, shit, like what else is there for me to do now? Like she did it. Like I, I can't do that. Um, and I really wish that I could. And so I think that, that I'm, I'm tempted to go with her, but in the same department, in the skills that I don't quite have, but really wish I had, um, I think China Meaville might be in danger because I know, I mean, the, the imagination and just the wild sort of out there-ness of it is something that I, I can do sort of like slightly less wild out there and I can do very dark out there but I can't do like cactus people with cactus culture I wish I could do cactus people so yeah cact cactus people in perfection that's what I want cactus people that's coming up there for Kate Atkinson's like one of her other books that no one reads because I couldn't even get through life after life so that should tell you that you know even books you think are perfect some other people don't like that however human croquet breaks oh yeah head puts me back together, uh, waters my crops, fixes my acne. Uh, it is one of my absolute all-time favorite books. It's not and you as know, it's, the title sounds. It's funny because <laughs> that's the, when, when I, when on those occasions, when I read a book that totally knocks me over and blows me away, the first thing I do is go on Goodreads and read all the one-star reviews. <laughs> yeah. And I know lots of other people who also just could not get behind Life After Life. I mean, um, I read but, Human Croquet, I'm like, okay, I'm reading Life After Life. Everyone says that's the most amazing one. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, I it mean. It anything for me, but like I read Human Croquet on my phone and wow. not a big phone like they have now. <laughs> my little <laughs> guess or something like that when I was on tour and I just, I could not stop reading it. It's such an amazing, brilliant book. Mm. Yeah. Um, hey, I don't like dark chocolate or bacon. So, you know, <laughs> there's different things for everybody. <laughs> Have you ever had dark chocolate, bake, bacon covered in dark chocolate? I have. Well, I've had it in like bar form. Mm. I think, was it um, Zingerman's made like a chocolate bacon chocolate bar? I, I had chocolate ice cream with bacon bits in it once and I was surprised. <laughs> I like the concept. Yeah, it's all too sweet. It's, you know. Or did you just take chocolate ice cream and put bacon? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I kind of think that's what they did. They just kind of sprinkled <laughs> it in there, but I don't know. It wasn't bad. I wouldn't get it again, but I was like, I, okay. <laughs> Sure. There was a shop in downtown Concord a few years ago, and their whole shtick was that they would dip anything in chocolate. And oh. it was really great. They're not there anymore. Um, mm. But it was really great. And they sold amazing like candy app candies apples and like you'd be like wow this is I have a sweet tooth and I was like I can't even finish this this is amazing. Um, but one April fools they did chocolate covered bacon. And it was 
people kept asking for it. And I was, it's like, but why? But why? And it was like a whole pieces of bacon that they dipped in chocolate and they had milk chocolate and they had dark chocolate. And they're just like, people buy it. Um, and it, they, they just, they did it. And they're just like, you know what? If the customers keep asking, and I they were like, I'm not certain if people actually like it or if they're getting it as a joke mm-hmm. for people. But I bought, a, I bought one. Um, I would, I didn't buy a second one. (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, And it was just, well, because the thing is, is like the bacon is cold and like is, I know, do not recommend unsubscribe. It was not great. (laughs) (laughs) See, I'm coming from a more British background of what bacon should be. And Mm. basically if bacon is hard enough that you can dip it in chocolate, something has gone terribly wrong <laughs> with the bacon. Like, I don't get this whole like, oh, it's cardboard and it tastes like salt. And I'm like, oh, it's meat. Right, and my husband <laughs> Leave it alone. completely know what you're talking about. Good, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's fair. That, uh, what Australians or folks in the UK consider bacon and chocolate, it would be gross. <laughs> really gross. Oh, terrible. <laughs> it would be floppy. Yeah. Like why? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> It's so bad. I would love to be someone who is just signing in. (laughs) Like, I thought this was a literary event. Like, I'm sorry. Have you met book nerds? Um, (laughs) We go massively off topic. Um, But I can get us back on track. Uh, I have more ridiculous questions. Um, and I would now like to ask to for each of you, would you rather write a love scene or a fight scene? Because both are tricky. I think and cat, you three look, people cat, on Howard, this you podcast. Look sudden, oh, cat, I, I think the cat's going to have the better answer on this one. I just feel like both is good. Both like, <laughs> just put them together. Simultaneous. Say, combine them. <laughs> I feel like I've read this fan fiction where the training montage turns into like smooches on the floor. I mean, pre- pre- I mean, preferably with edged weapons. I use defense. I mean, come on. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think actually there was a scene in um, my third novel that was a makeout that ended up with the protagonist breaking a beer bottle over the back of the guy's <laughs> head that she was theoretically being kissed by. So. I- there's your answer for me. <laughs> I love this. Look, I have a great amount of respect for people who can write very good fight scenes. I think the three people on this uh, call who have read my book will probably guess that my answer is very definitely love scenes. But I do think they have a lot of similarities in the way that you approach them. Like they're, they're there to do a certain thing. You have to pay a lot of attention to blocking or you will miss <laughs> a limb. And... <laughs> Yep. But all in all, much rather write a sex scene than a fight scene. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, um, for our folks in the chat who have not yet had the pleasure of, of reading A Marvelous Light, which comes out in November, pre-order it. Um, it is a amazing romance. And there was, I was reading it at work at one point and Freya described, I don't know, forearms, that's it seemingly innocuous and I blushed and had to put the book down <laughs> it was like I can't read this at work I'm I'm blushing because of forearms <laughs> I swear I've been warning people like I've been handing it to all of my co-workers and been like it does get steamy guys and nobody believes me and then ends up in these situations I definitely have had multiple co-workers be like oh my god it got really sexy I'm like yes Look, I'm beginning my career as I mean to go on. (laughs) Ryan, Ryan and I have a steam scale at work for our romance novels. Ryan, where would this land? Would it? it, Presumably, it is above one smooches, two tensions rising, three fades to black. So, is it four or five? Is it like steam alert or burn alert? Five. Okay. All right. I think. I think we're. I think we're pretty safely in five territory. Yeah. <laughs> in note. Okay. Yeah, do you want me to lend you my arc of it? <laughs> uh, the lives of booksellers. One of us gets an arc and we're just like, do you want it? You have to give it back. But do, do you want it? Do you want it? You have to review it. 
gets passed you can't. The Be careful with the cover. Do you need a case? Do you need a case? Don't break the spine. <laughs> About a year ago, I think you guys might remember, I I sew because I can't sit still. Um, but I, I started making book sleeves and I started giving them to all my coworkers at the holidays because I was just like, everybody kept coming back with like the arcs all tattered. And it's like, no, put it in a bag before you put it in your book. Okay. So, <laughs> all right, Kat, would you, Kat Valenti, would you rather write a fight scene or a love scene? Smooches or stabs? <laughs> Honestly, I've been writing comedy in middle grade for a while, so it's been it's been a good whack of time since I wrote a love scene. Uh, but I I feel like as as I listened to all of you talk, I thought I feel like I'm I'm constantly trying to write both scenes without actually using sex or violence. Mm -hmm. uh, so like there's a scene in Deathless which is a meal uh, and has been you know called the sexiest scene I've ever written by anybody who reads. Uh, my work, including my dad, which was a weird moment, <laughs> uh, and there's no sex in that scene whatsoever. Uh, there's not in any nudity. It's 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 just a meal. And then um, the one in space opera is is alien sex. So they literally brush each other's hair. That's uh, that species. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so I feel like I'm constantly trying to do these things without doing them. Like you know, write the poem about love, but don't use the word love. And I feel like it's the same thing with fight scenes because I I'm not Cat Howard. I don't really uh, do the whole weapons thing. I don't uh, I don't do that. I don't know that much about it. That I have to do a lot of research for it. So I feel like it, similarly, uh, and I'm a classicist. So you know, usually in classics when there's a fight, you don't see it. Somebody just comes and tells you about it way later. Um, <laughs> so I feel like I'm always doing this. I am setting up uh, battles that aren't about violence and sex that isn't about physicality. I feel like that is one of my things that I didn't know was my thing until this question. <laughs> Amazing. The more you know. <laughs> which is harder? Which is harder to gloss over and allude to? I th Well, I do think that love scenes are really hard. Um, and part of the reason that they're hard, I've had, I read a book called Palimpsest, which is like, how many sex scenes can you get into a book uh, and not? <laughs> have people get upset. But what I kind of ran into with Palimpsest and with other books that I've had uh, significant sexual contact, contact, content, very different, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> is that um, I guess probably fighting similar, everybody thinks they know about sex. They think they know how sex should go. They think they know what's enjoyable. They think they know what's good, what's bad. Uh, and so you are constantly running directly into a really personal, private, very strongly held opinion uh, every time you write a sex scene. Uh, and I feel like there are more people who don't know anything about fighting than who don't know anything <laughs> about sex. And so you can kind of get away with a little bit more, but you are always having to manage uh, your audience's expectations of real life mm -hmm. in a sex scene um, in a way that you don't always with battles, particularly if they are in science fiction and fantasy and therefore can be anything. Well, see, for me, I think that individualism is one of the best, the best parts of writing a sex scene because it, you can make it so individual to the character mm -hmm. and show somebody a lot about what they are like. But I agree that you can't make them universal. And I think it's a risk that anybody who puts a lot of that kind of scene into their work, especially if you're working in a genre where it's not expected, you are going to have a lot more people bounce off it because it does not meet their expectations or it's just not what they're looking for or it rubs them a little bit the wrong way no pun intended and, <laughs> and they're mad about it <laughs> so i think it's the kind of scene where for the people who will it works for and who think yes this works for me that will work really well but you are always going to have a larger percentage of people for whom it's just not working and that's a that's a risk yeah that's a good point <clears throat> all right i got i have one, two more questions here for us to argue about. Uh, let's see here. Um, would you rather, this is a writing and craft question. Would you rather write one, fight 100 paragraphs that aren't quite working in your manuscript or one glaring plot hole? Oh, Don't one glaring plot this time. hole. 100% one mm -hmm. glaring plot hole. Uh, I like 100 paragraphs. Do you know how long my paragraphs are? Oh my God. No. <laughs> I swear to you, I could write at least a novella that is a hundred paragraphs and that's the whole book. So I would much rather deal, and I'm doing it right now with these edits for um, Osmond Unknown, uh, like deal with one plot problem 
that I can, you know, stitch in from various parts and then go seed it so it looks like I did foreshadowing, but actually I did a mistake uh, and like fix all that up. Then having to deal with a hundred uh, paragraphs that just aren't exactly right. Oh, that, that sounds exhausting just thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I can solve a plot problem like in the shower or playing video games or cooking dinner or cleaning the bathtub or you know like plot problems are plot problems are fun they're easy they're they're like a when I was like a kid and I used to do those logic problems with the little x's and the little o's like it's like that but for grown-ups but the paragraphs I would probably just cut <laughs> like, see if it's not no working offense. and it return the advance like yeah <laughs> if there's that many paragraphs that aren't working no i'm Clearly sorry no offense wrong. intended to my fellow authors but you're both completely wrong i would much <laughs> rather much rather have to go through my entire book paragraph by paragraph and like make tiny little tweaks and fiddle with the wording and <laughs> like you know one of my early books my agent came back and said i think it's great it's good it's ready to go now go through and remove 5000 words and I had to do that on the sentence level. Yeah. And it was all just sentence by sentence. And I really enjoyed that. I found that a really fun challenge. Whereas a plot hole, I look at it and I, I don't know, like, where do I start eating this? It's too big. I much prefer like going through and like little nibbles, little tweaks, polishing the wording, making the rhythm of the sentence better. I think that just suits me better. It seems much less daunting than staring down a plot hole and not having any idea where to start tweaking things. Yeah, I, I think I feel, Kat agrees. Yeah, yes, I do. Very, very strongly. Mm -hmm. I feel very strongly that plot is something that happens to other people. Um, I <laughs> no, no plot holes, no thank you. Um, I will I will fix everyone else's paragraphs also before I fix my own plot holes. So just you know, like please give uh, all the paragraphs, no, no, no plots, no. <laughs> so yeah, my 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 draft is going really well. Thanks. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Um, and then uh, what is your favorite trope in fantasy or science fiction? Or actually, I suppose romance. Mine is, oh, no, there's only one bed. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, there's different tropes in romance versus fantasy versus sci-fi. Um, do you have a favorite? And that's there's two kinds of favorites. Do you have a favorite to write? And do you have a favorite to read? Because those are two different things. You all are thinking very, very hard right now. All right. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the difference between romance tropes and sci-fi fantasy tropes, because I was about to say marriage and convenience, but in space. Ooh. Because, you know, shout out to Winter's Orbit by Everina Maxwell, which just did that very well. Yes. But I yeah. love <laughs> reading relationships of convenience like we have to get married oh no for reasons we we have to pretend to be a couple for reasons mm -hmm. uh and so the book that i'm actually writing at the moment is a romance novel with fake dating ice dancers in it and playing in with space? those tropes not in space <laughs> funnily enough i i relax in my downtime between edits from writing fantasy by writing contemporary romance so no space involved whatsoever just fake dating do you need but, a yeah. reader <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Send it to us. <laughs> yeah, something about the relationship being fake or convenienced, or we have to get married because we are the heirs to a warring kingdom, that kind of thing. That's that's my absolute romance jam. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think scrappy outsider makes good. Like I I I'm very into a scrappy outsider who like you know doesn't necessarily have to be like the chosen one of the prophecy but um scraps their way in and you know has grand adventures and becomes very important i don't know what this says about me psychologically but i think that's where i that's where i end up and it's really i, I think i i have a lot of favorites where the scrappy outsider is unexpectedly an outsider like the one that I always think of is um Robin McKinley's The Hero and the Crown you know where the the princess is not the right princess and ends up killing the dragon and yeah I think I've read two 
novels in the past few years where the chosen one dies nice. um and then the novel is continued by like their best fr- basically if samwise ganji picked up the ring from frodo and was just like all right i guess we gotta finish the quest i would um, be so into that i would it, read that well, if you like jenny mayville that's in unlundon yeah mm. yep yeah yeah i've noticed it i've noticed it in in book descriptions more and more and i'm like yes Thank you, because I really, the chosen one has everything pushing for them. And I really like see, and they're always like, I'm a completely normal person. And it's just like, yes, okay, you know, but like, but then the actual normal person like continues and they're just like, this is, this is not going to work because I'm not the chosen one. So what do we do now? And I'm really, really loving it. All right. Cat or cat. (laughs) I don't know. I think, I don't even know if this is a trope, but I really like rich people having expensive problems books. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, that, that's kind of, you know, if it's the, if the aristocracy are doing something wrong in space with magic, whatever, I'm there. That, that, that's my thing. I love that. I, uh, I like a dark queen. To take a dark queen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really enjoy and do intend to write one day the whole um, join me and let us rule the universe together uh, thing, which they never ever do, but should, um, especially if it's a dark queen. <laughs> Just put those together. Uh, yeah, I mean, I like a lot of my work is sort of deeply rooted in screwing with tropes. Um, so I, it's it's a weird question um, for me to answer, but I I mean I certainly I enjoy the whole catabasis journey to the underworld thing way too much. Um, I, I would be hard pressed to point out a book of mine that isn't that on some level. So uh, yeah, <laughs> that that'll, that'll do big. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> the big in question. <laughs> Awesome. Um, Cool. I think, Elizabeth, I think that's pretty much our hour. Yes, it it is. Does anybody have like their cat at hand or? I can get him in about two seconds. Yeah, I can get some pets. Please show us your cat, dog, bunny. (laughs) Kelly, I know you have a bunny. I do. I do. I can show pictures of the bunny, but if I brought the bunny here, it would not. And he is not allowed in the office. (laughs) He is not allowed in the office. <laughs> Bunny eats books. <laughs> I'm going to try and convince mine to come up. Oh, yep. Joe, what's your cat's name? Uh, Roz. Rosalind. Goes by Roz. <gasps> Look at this kitty coming. Oh, Whoa. my God. Oh, oh simultaneous so kitties. Oh, my God. Gosh. He's okay, is that a trick of the camera or is no, the cat the same he's size as actual cat? He's very big. <laughs> that <laughs> you, is, cat, is that a Maine Coon or a Norwegian forest cat? Maine Coon. Oh. Hey, hello, buddy. He says, um, I am a rich person with expensive problems. <laughs> 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 I, I adore him because of this. <laughs> I love him. He's such a good boy. He was extremely sick last year and the internet Aww. saved him, but it means that instead of being tuxedo anymore, he has all kinds of colors now. Oh, interesting. He was so traumatized because his blood was broken. <laughs> he changed colors. Crazy. I had a black cat once that whenever she was, she had a surgery or something, the fur would grow back in white. She was very strangely oh colored by the time she left us at 20. I well, there's a, there's a fantasy trope that I really like. Trauma yeah. hair. Oh yeah. Oh I've yeah. A lot of, I've been watching a lot of Chinese wuxia dramas recently, and they go really in for like the white trauma hair. Oh yeah. It's a good trope. Okay. That's a good one. Oh my gosh, these are very. Oh look at the bunny. <gasps> that is the rabbit eating an actual manuscript. <laughs> Sorry, I can't show you closer. But I came downstairs yesterday and discovered. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Okay, that, that paragraph wasn't very important. It was one of the hundred that I could cut. <laughs> and Kat, is that Viola? This is Viola. Oh. I know. Look, she's, she's like hugging you. 
She's she's named for Shakespeare Viola. I appreciate that we both have cats named after Shakespearean comedy heroines. I'm sorry, what was your cat's name? Rosalind. Ah, oh, perfect. I appreciate anybody with a pet with a com Shakespearean comedy name. <laughs> Excellent. I have a friend with one named Curio, which I thought was a great name. Oh, that's a great, great name. name for You're all done? Okay. Byron says he's out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and done. <laughs> I'm willing to send a tiny chicken to anybody with a cat. Just <laughs> they're very good cat toys. <laughs> so uh, there we go. Uh, the cats steal them immediately. So yep. <laughs> yep. we sent some to Lady Vesper, uh, Aaron Morgenstern's cat. <laughs> Got some tiny chickens. Yes. So serious, serious would be happy to send a tiny chicken to anybody. Um, I think, I think that's, I think that's it. I think did we that's do it? it. We did it. We We're did it, time. friends. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for putting this together. Oh yeah, thank, thank you for thank having you. us. Thank you. Thank you. This was totally uh, hey, I wonder if I can get some authors together and hey, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you for helping us celebrate Indie Bookstore. Um, I again will will you know flush out the uh, shoppable list and we'll post that in the next few days. Um, this will this has been recorded, so we'll get this edited and uploaded uh, in the next couple of days as well. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for coming, especially Freya. Thanks. Now you can like have your full day ahead of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, coffee time like now. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks to all our, our audience members who joined us. You're all great. Have a great night, everybody. Bye, guys. Hey.